Right, hello everyone again. This is our fourth screencast uh, and lecture from Chemical Kinetics. Uh, so to, in this session, we're gonna cover a bit more on the initial rates method. So the last screencast, we covered kind of a basic idea of how to graph it. And then the lecture we went through how to do it just via equations, not using any graphs or anything like that. So this, I'm gonna mostly cover that solution again, step by step. So if you want to cover it uh, again, please watch ahead. If you're happy with it, uh, sure, feel free to skip this one and go on to the next bit. Uh, I'm also going to cover something on using Excel to make this uh, solution. So if you're not too, um, what, what's it? if you're not too much of an advanced Excel user, you might get some use out of that or you might not. It's optional, obviously it's not going to be examined but it is one of the more powerful tools we can really learn to use. So I'm gonna introduce some ideas of using some functions and some shortcuts and just how to deal with it on a computer. So what we're really gonna cover today, we're going to have a look at the data that we've got. Uh, we're gonna then kind of crunch down some equations. So what the first thing we're gonna look at is uh, how do we convert those race laws into the log form of the equations that are really useful for the initial rates method uh, and then we're going to throw those data together uh, go into how to solve it for excel and if you're just interested in the rate the rate law and the solutions at the end again click the youtube links at the bottom if you want that and once again my uh, pen is not very happy so here it is it's back now uh so we have two things, we have A and B, and they will go to C. It doesn't matter what they are, this is just kind of the generic thing for now. Uh, and the rate at time zero, the initial rate, the very first thing is equal to a rate constant multiplied by the concentration of A at time zero, multiplied by the concentration of B at time zero. And these are raised to two powers, A and B here. Now you might see n or m or x and y, it doesn't matter. These are just two numbers and we're gonna find out what those numbers are. So we can see from this sort of schematic graph, when a has got a huge initial concentration, it will go down quickly. And then our third experiment, then our fourth experiment, uh, second and third experiments. So we've been given three experiments with three different rate constants, or at least three different rates that we've managed to figure out for time equals zero. So notice the fact that these curve, that means that the rate actually slows down as um, the reaction proceeds. That's because the rate is proportional to concentration. So we're not solving the rate constant, which is, well, at least we're not yet gonna solve the rate constant, which is constant across the reaction. We are solving the rate. So this is our data. We make one uh, run where we have 2.3 and 3.1 as our relative concentrations and we get the initial rate as 5.25 and then a second run with this data and a third run. Now the important thing to note here is that we have two runs where our concentration of B has been kept the same. This now means these are directly comparable with each other. So we've been given two rates and we notice that oh that's roughly gone up by well we can do it eyeball and just say well 42 to 170 that's uh, wow four times even though we've roughly doubled the concentration of A here so we can work out a proportional dis difference between these two concentrations and a proportional distance there and get an estimate for A but now we're going to do it a little bit more mathematically rigorously uh, something that will be far more extensible if you have a more complicated system and a lot more data points so this is going to be a bit taxing but don't worry about it, we'll take it slow. We've already done this in the lecture, so this should be a recap. First thing I want to do is make sure that all of these are in the actual numbers. I've multiplied in by these. I should have deleted this from the table, but evidently I've forgotten about it. Uh, so these are the actual raw numbers. Uh, I've missed off a couple of decimal places. Turns out they are not too important. If you go follow this data through yourself, do it in Excel or keep as many significant figures as you can. Right, so just to kind of demonstrate an idea here, we're going to take logarithms of each of these values and put them in the table. Uh, now I've kept the same color uh, coding scheme. So all the values that are in red are belong to one experiment, all the values in amber 
or in another experiment and all the green ones are in another experiment as well so we can keep track of what goes away through this colouring scheme if you can't quite follow the labels. Uh, so here are the log forms again uh, in this and we want to take the rate law and take some logs of it. Uh, again this is a really common feature so get used to either pressing this on your calculator or typing equals ln into Excel when we come to it. So that rate goes to log of the rate and then because these are multiplied together they split up so we covered this in the last lecture and these exponents now come down here so we've got three equations that are effectively linear now uh, that means they can be added and subtracted so what we want to do is basically start adding and subtracting them so we've got these two data points here where we kept b constant so we're going to just focus on number two and three for now here they are rate two and rate three's equation uh, when we take logs of them these are exactly the same thing remember we've just given them different labels so this is the concentration for experiment two and experiment three and so on and we're going to subtract them so this looks really long uh, but it does actually make sense for where this is coming from we've simply taken one and subtracted it from the other so as you can see the section involving rate number two here has come down rate number three all of those parts have been brought in together uh, it just it's it's adding and subtracting it takes a little while to keep on top of it and it will take a while to write out manually but that's them there and if we get rid of that just so we can see we can see things start to cancel out uh, our log k's well those values are going to be identical because k is a constant no matter what we do to the reaction apart from change the temperature um, and because the concentration of B was the same in those two experiments, these two also cancel out. So all the log B concentrations are identical. This gets us a nifty little formula, which is as a function of two rates, which we know the answer to, two concentrations, which we know, and then A. And this is the value that we are interested in. So we are going to solve for just that one value for now. Now, if we mess around with the logarithms a little bit, uh, logs, when you subtract them from each other, it's effectively the equivalent of dividing by. Uh, or you can, because we calculated these log values and put them in their own table, just use this equation. This one might be slightly simpler. That one might be slightly simpler, whichever way you want. They are two ways of representing the exact same thing. We are trying to solve for A at the end of the day. So here's our data for just the values, um, not the log version, so I'm going to do it this way. Uh, rate 2 over rate 3 equals A, log A2 over A3. So the values from, say, 1, 2, and 3 need to go into the right place. And when you crunch those down, you end up with a value of 2.0170. Um, so that roughly rounds off to about 2. So our value of A up here is 2. That's its second order with respect to A. That was sort of in line with the initial guesstimate as well. So we're doing quite well. What about our next bits? Uh, well, we've now got a value of A. And we've got, go back to our three equations here. Uh, we're at one, we're at two. The log values are just inputted into this table. And what you can see is that now we've got a series of equations where we have values of B that we want to find out, values of A which we now know, and concentrations that we also know. So you can do a similar kind of process as before. Um, if you want to solve the equations individually, uh, that's possibly just about valid, but you want to be able to cancel out this log K because you don't yet know what the rate constant is. So if we take rate one and two, these two equations, and subtract them once more, exactly the same logic as before, uh, here we go, we're subtracting two things, the two logs here come down, uh, and so on. Oh, I've not recolored this one properly, that should be red. Uh, but never mind, there you go, you can see that they come down, they subtract. Only the log k's um, cancel out this time, because those are the only ones that are the same. But, because we know A, 
we can now calculate this. We can now also calculate that. Those are values that are known. Those are values that are known. And as a result, if we start plugging in the other values that we've got, B works out as 1. So we can actually throw those numbers in. I'm not going to do it manually. We'll cover a bit in the Excel bit soon. Uh, so Microsoft Excel, you've probably played with some spreadsheets before. Let's uh, have a look at it. So hopefully my face in the top right corner shouldn't be overlapping with this too much. So let's have a look at what I've done. I'm going to delete out these for a bit. First of all, I've put my rate up here. I've just gone into the equation editor and written it down. So this is, I'm constantly reminded of it. Uh, and I've also formatted it all nicely. If you haven't used it before, you want to be highlighting up here. And when you right click, you want to go to format cells and you use superscript. Unfortunately, Excel doesn't have a shortcut for putting things into superscripts and subscripts. It's a bit uh, annoying. Um, Unfortunately, but all the data is in here. I color coded it as I had before. So that's our initial data. First things first, we want to get it into the absolute numbers. We don't want it in that standard form. So what I've put into these cells is equals 10. Now, if you want to write things linear, it is the upper hat uh, key. Um, it's shift six on my laptop. It should be similar on everyone else's uh, to minus four. That gets us 0 0.001. And then the same for here to the minus 5. Here, if I add a couple of more decimal places, you can see here and to the minus 4 there. So what I want to do is, uh, well, you would multiply that value by this value. Now I'm going to do a little bit of an Excel trick that you should probably learn. I'm going to hit the F4 key, and what you'll see is these dollar signs uh, appear in front of the numbers in the column. Uh, now, I sometimes call these strings because um, sometimes in older programming languages, dollar signs got used for declaring string variables. Uh, yeah. So what I want to do is actually delete one of these. Now, you can actually keep pressing F4 again and cycle through them, but it's easier to delete. So what this is going to do is whenever I start dragging the cell around, uh, it's going to keep 13 constant. So if I drag this across doo -doo -doo, and go back to this one, what I've done is I've multiplied now this cell by that cell. Fantastic. Now what I want to do is draw them all a box around and drag it down. And if I click this button and go fill without formatting, it keeps a bit of formatting that I preset there before. So you can add that in manually if you like. It's uh, tell you to but what you'll find is that because we've kept number 13 constant here it is always going to multiply the right one down here now you could go through and do that manually and do it nine times but imagine your data set is a lot bigger uh, imagine doing it nine times 20 times 100 times this sort of thing is really powerful and useful in excel and it's worth getting uh, to grips back with right so now the next table I want to do, I want to hit the logs. Uh, now in all the previous ones, I didn't use those log numbers, uh, but here we'll do the exact same thing again. I want to introduce a formula now. So there's equals, and this is a really easy one, L, N. You can just about do it if you type in lowercase as well, but Excel just kind of defaults to uppercase for these functions. So L, N, and I want to open your bracket Stick your number in there, close the bracket. This version of it might even complete that automatically with that bracket. Yeah, it does. Uh, so now, if I've taken a log of that, I can also drag across and... Oops. There we go. There we go. I've now... I've put these equations in via equation editor and they're getting in the way, unfortunately. Anyway, we've now got the log numbers uh, and everything. So that was done quite relatively speedily if you just drag and drop down, of course. Uh, and it saves uh, 
you having to do this manually. Now, I've seen people who really don't understand computers type in things like, oh, log to forward stick into a calculator and then manually type it into Excel. And they've done that for dozens upon dozens of data points. Seriously, don't do that. Just drag and drop uh, to fill in your multiple cells and learn how to use these string values or the, the dollar signs to help make absolute references. Learn how to do that, use it, apply it. It is the 21st century now. We should be doing this by default. Uh, and now I've added in the other equations that I want, and this is telling me the values I want to calculate. So now I'm going to teach you a little bit of an Excel trick. Uh, so it's called named ranges, and I use this a lot because it simplifies things down. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick these rates. So these are the rates that I know, and I'm going to right click it, and I'm going to go to define name. Then I'm going to call it rate. And now I click OK, but I've already done this uh, in advance. So if I go up into the top left here and click rate, it highlights those three cells. And I've done the same for these three as well. I've called it A concentration. If I click that, it highlights it. B concentration it highlights there. So that comes entirely from highlighting a range, right clicking and going to define name. This is really, really useful. So that means now if I wanted to, or well, maybe you'd be used to doing some and then dragging down, okay? As you can see, it actually automatically recognizes that as a conch. So if I just type that in, there we go, that's my named range. If I want to do average, I would just write say B conch. Okay, these values aren't really useful to us for kinetics, but you know, it's a nice shortcut for using the same cells over and over again. You don't have to go out and select them, you just give them a name. Um, it's really useful later on in kinetics. I'll show you how to uh, do some simulations and if you name your rate constant cell, for instance, it becomes really easy. So we have an experimental number. We have a rate A conch and B conch. Uh, now I want to take down certain values as given by these equations. Now, again, this is a really long winded thing for Excel uh, for a data set this small, but if you're doing it on much more um, extensive data with a lot of data points, this will this method will be invaluable. And it is something called index. So I'm going to type in an equal sign down here, and I'm going to type index. So this says that it returns the value or reference of the cell at the intersection of a particular row or column in a given range. That sounds a bit long winded and wordy. So let's open a bracket and have a look what it's after. Ah, now it's asking for an array or a named range of data. We already have some. I'm going to call it rate. There we go. I don't need to go and find the cells. I know that the rate cells contain this. Uh, and I want to pick the row number. And I have three, one, two, or three. Now I could just type that number in, but I'm going to instead select that. This cell, so D37, but I've got a number two in it. And I've done the same on the bottom row. And as you can see, I've filled in the rest. I'm still always referencing that cell for the number uh, and the index changes between rate, the A concentration and the B concentration. So if we have a look, the rate number 2, 0.0042, right down here, 0.0042. So it has actually extracted this value down and brought it to us. Now the reason I'm doing it this way is because I want number 2 and number 3 out. I've given number two and number two here, so that's just type three. There we go. Now, what I've dragged down from the above cells are these numbers. Again, this is the long-winded, weird way of doing it, but if your data set is much bigger, this will be invaluable to you. You won't have to then go hunting for the numbers manually. You just need to know where it is in your array. Um, so if we have an array of just three, it seems really trivial, but if you've got an array of 100 rate constants, believe me, you want to do this. Uh, so we've picked number two, number three, and here they are. Now we want to find the log of rate two over rate three. So all I need to do is find ln of rate two, that's that cell, divided by this cell. Now, if I want to show off a lot, I could just type in Instead of these helper cells, I could just type in the index function and bring them out, but I don't want to do that. It's a bit pointless. Uh, and we also want the value of 
log a2 divided by a3. Uh, also, another cool thing about this is if you preset up an Excel spreadsheet like this uh, and you have all the functions in, you can reuse it again and again. So if you are doing some research that involves getting rate constants for about 50 different reactions, well, instead of going through this process 50 different times, set it up, have blank spaces for your data, insert your data and get the program to solve it for you. It saves a lot of time. This is kind of why I'm telling you the long-winded versions. Now, if you rearrange this equation to solve for A, you essentially want that divided by that number, 2.0174, which just so happens to be what I copied down into this cell here. Uh, and just as another function, what I've done is the round function. So we wanted to round it off, type round, open up. And what number do I want? I want to round that one down. So how many digits? One. There we go. We've solved it. A is now two. So if I were to at some point rerun three more experiments like this, all I would need to do is copy my data that I get into here. And there we go. That's my rate law half solved already. Brilliant. So now I've done the same thing down here, but instead of well, I could replace it with one and two and just see what happens. Uh, but instead, I've redone it exactly the same as with using these index functions, picked experiments one and two, solved it down here using the exact same way I've referenced these cells to get logarithms. Uh, in fact, I could replace that two with that cell. There we go. Same thing. Uh, and then I wanted to divide those because that's them joining together. And then once we divided them together, we get one. So that is, I'll, I'll try and stick this sheet up on um, Canvas for you to read through and have a look at. Uh, and that's kind of it for Excel. There's a couple of different functions in there that I think are really useful. And I think it's really useful to see them used in context certainly for solving this. You can do it manually if you want. Uh, you don't have to do this. I just think that you know, it's useful to know. So anyway, that's our Excel -y bit. So now let's have a look at the solution. Our rate is k, a squared times b. We've got those numbers out. So a came from that, b came from one. Uh, now we now have an equation. So I'm gonna just, we have, three rates, for instance, we want to find k, this rate constant. Uh, so we worked out this coefficient, this coefficient. We also have some data for these now. So what we can do is sit through and divide through, uh, well, re rearrange that, it's rate over a squared b. There we go. Save you the hassle of doing that yourself. Solve that for three different rows of our table. And there we go, our k averages. I've taken an average of all these three, probably not need to do this repeatedly. Uh, and we get 3.214 times 10 to the 8. So that's actually a really fast reaction as well. So let's go through and just review what we did. Well, our data, we collected three experimental runs. Uh, well, at least three, you probably want to get more for statistical reasons to make sure they're all Right, and at least two have an equal concentrations kind of, of B because we want to compare them, they cancel it. So with our equations, we take a log of the rate and log of the concentrations of both A and B, of course, for all the data. Uh, we do the both sides of the rate law as well, so that, um, sorry, I keep writing K equals, uh, rate equals K times a, B, whatever, we take a log of that and it produces a long equations. And then if we subtract two equations, we get to eliminate the identical components because we've, remember, we've got equal concentrations of B, we can eliminate those. And we get an equation which is a function of this exponent A. So we get that. Now we subtract the two others and we get a function of the two other values that we need. So if we plug the first exponent back in, we can solve for the second one. So once we've got data for A, we can actually get B just by, in fact, three data points, 
you might want a few more and uh, depending on how rigorous you want to do it so in excel we did a bit of this this is extension so if you skipped it you'll have missed out remember use your column as headings and to keep things clear because if you're going to use uh, excel to format a lot of data it's going to run away from you quite quick if you're talking about hundreds of data points you need to have a good handle on it so i've used color coding throughout this red green and um, yellow for the three different kinetic runs that we've done um, i find that useful if you're not very good with color or you're slightly color blind find another option uh, maybe something higher contrast for instance uh, don't forget to convert everything by a real values so you want to multiply things by 10 to this power of five or power to minus four and so on and the log values ln uh, and the other things i kind of went into the functions are index uh, that is where you stick an array in here so that's your range of numbers and then which number so if i have five cells in here and i set this to five then one two three four it'll return this fifth value here which is pretty really useful um it's pretty much one of the most useful functions in excel which no one uses uh, unless you're really good with it so and finally our solution we get A and B, which may not necessarily be perfectly round numbers, so just round it off to the nearest whole or convenient fraction, because yes, sometimes the rate law is not whole numbers, but for 99% of your purposes, it definitely should be. Um, most of the time, it'll be right. Put these into your rate law. So rate is equal to K times A to B to the one, solve for K. So, pretty simple yes we've taken about nearly half an hour to go through all of that uh, <clears throat> but hopefully that is a nice convenient and encapsulation of the solution for this so after this we're going to go on to the pseudo first order approximation uh, and a little bit more of a convenient way of solving for k from some rate data um, <clears throat> but until then see you at the next lecture